I'm very passionate about the human brain and cognition, and I've been wanting to add brain videos to my brain video playlist for a long time. I just haven't really taken the time because of everything else that's been going on because life happens, but I need to make some space on my hard drive. And I think that one thing that would be mutually beneficial is to go through some of these old discussion board posts that I have. And I don't necessarily need to save this information, but I have a lot of hesitation in deleting these files because I work so hard in gathering this information. So I think what I'd like to do is just compartmentalize these videos and go through as I'm eliminating these files and I'd like to share. So this particular discussion board post, this is these are my grad school files. So this is specifically going to be about medical neuroscience. This discussion board post comes from the first week of class and the question specifically is, write a brief description of how functional imaging studies are conducted, then explain the author's interpretation of the study implications for understanding brain function, finally explain how I would describe these results, and support my postings and responses with specific references to the literature and learning resources. I will post my links below if you choose to go and pursue it further. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk about it. I love the brain. My response is as follows. There are multiple ways in which functional imaging can be performed, and ultimately the kind of test performed depends on what the researcher is searching for. For example, authors Driver, Blankenberg, Bessmond, and Ruff, 2010, suggest that a larger encompassing network of areas are responsible in brain function when fMRI was performed on healthy participants as well as patients demonstrating brain lesion. But also the flip side suggests that a different type of test, a TMS, or a transcranial magnetic stimulation, can sometimes indicate that a single brain area may make a key contribution to a particular particular cognitive process. These data help reinforce that the specific outcome of knowledge from functional imaging is conducive to the type of test performed. Several methods of these tests are listed very easily and readily available on the internet, and all you have to do is type in functional neuroimaging. Of the six most common methods listed, PET scans and fMRI can give a real-time imaging of these multiple areas working in conjunction with each other. And this is different from the electrical monitoring and data that EEG and MEG procedures offer. And the fairly new procedure of FNIRS, majoring oxygen in the brain, centered on activities both before and after events. And FNIRS is functional near-infrared spectroscopy. So... PET scans, PET, or positron-emitted tomography, they're very costly and they involve ingestion of an isotopically labeled or a genetically marked for identification during the test substance. It's referred to as a glucose analog. And when it's taken up and transported by the cells, it's not ingested by the cells. Nelson and Cox, 2008. Essentially, it's a dye injected in the arm and it acts as an identifier by bonding more heavily with these cancerous areas, simply because tumors need sugar to grow. And once the F-labeled 2-fluoro-2-deoxoglucose, or FDG, formula has had time to spread, the body can be scanned to find these areas with a higher concentration of this sugary substance, as they will bind to those areas more heavily and produce a darker area when imaged. So the PET scan is a good identifier for cancer that may have spread, and as a cellular identifier, the PET can identify tumors or irregularities based on ATP and sugar reuptake, hence the darker areas of concentrated isotopes. So I don't know if I should sidestep to ketoacidosis, ATP, and sugars here, or just proceed with the test methods and go through the biological rundown of glucose. So there's glucose uptake versus high glucose utilization in those tumorous spots. And this is also demonstrated by PET imaging. But moving forward, not to get too technical, I'll just say that the PET scan, despite the cost and the time involved, it's a great way to quote unquote find these cancerous cells that might have spread to potentially other hidden areas of your body. Also, despite the effort involved, it's a brilliantly simple theory. It's just time consuming. 
Functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, is another great method of medical imaging, but it uses a blood O2 level contrast for its readings. It's widely used because unlike the PET, the fMRI does not involve ingesting anything, nor does it require injections of radioactive imaging. The fMRI is a very useful tool to measure real-time activity, especially in TR fMRI, which is temporal resolution. And this is the smallest time period of neural activity reliably measurable. So another version of fMRI, TMS fMRI, this is a pulsed magnetic field forcing a neurotransmitter action or emission. Thus, this enhances the neurotransmissions in the brain by targeting a magnetic stimulation. So basically, it forces the release of serotonin to a neurotransmitter by the means of magnetic stimulation. Magnetically massages your your transmitters to cause that reuptake action and that release of serotonin. This is also an area under review by researchers and it's used to study spatial cognition and spatial function. Moving on, another version of imaging is EEG or electroencephalography, which I kind of liken that to looking up a seismometer to your head to measure the electrical movement or spikes therein in your brain's electrical activities. And this is kind of a crude interpretation, but it's a good visual interpretation of how the EEG measures spikes of electrical discharge from the brain, albeit on a much more complex system of analysis. It's great for assessing unusual brain activity, coma, depth of anesthesia, and amazingly, it's even used to measure brain death. Similar to the EEG, the MEG, um, well, the EEG is measured with electrodes affixed to your head. It's non-invasive, and it just measures your brainwave activity. But the MEG, or magnetic encephalography, it's essentially a measure of our own bioelectric emissions. So I'm kind of skeptical about this one because it's fairly new, and this methodology is borderline pseudoscience. It involves the participant to be treated in a triple layer thick brick room, shielding them from the Earth's own natural magnetic emissions. This procedure involves wearing a loosely fitted helmet and it can be beneficial for measuring the, brave, the brain's electrical activity. And it helps assist in some diagnoses of events like epilepsy. And I see how measuring, or the theory of measuring the electrical emission releasing a magnetic dipole is relevant. But I sometimes have to question because that emission can be weakly undetectable, overtly misleading, and I just think that we should not rely on it by itself. So from what I found out already, though, the EEG is widely used for everything from Alzheimer's diagnosis to narcolepsy, not the MEG, which is the questionable one. So another form of assessment is, is the FNIRS, or Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy, and I didn't really have any familiarity with this before college. Um, the concept is very fascinating though, because although it measures blood, blood brain activity level, it's conducted by near infrared light. And despite being fairly new and not a widespread treatment, it's very simple to perform. It's just an electrode attached to your forehead and data collected before, during, and after activities is analyzed, measuring changes in blood flow and O2 levels in the brain. So I can see how it could be very beneficial and I could even envision some future crossbreed polygraph uh, to simplify a test for questioning. And as we know now, the polygraph is not admissible because it's speculative, borderline pseudoscience and not admissible in a court of law because they can be very easily thrown. So the final the final test on the list is SPECT, S-P-E-C-T. This is a single photon emission computed tomography. This test is similar to the PET scan because it uses a radioactive substance to gain an image, although it's a much broader test in its diagnostic outcomes. And this includes everything from heart flow functionality, brain oxygenation issues, head trauma, epilepsy, seizures, and even clogged arteries and vessels. As in the PET procedure, the injected radioactive dye takes about 20 minutes to spread, after which the patient is placed in a scanner chamber, similar to being scanned with a large 3D camera. The scan offers a three-dimensional view based on the injectable radionuclide. 
this offers a view of amounts of blood flow in the capillaries. So again, this you can even detect clogged arteries here because if you have very low blood flow going through that capillary, that injectable radionuclide is going to show that. So overall, each procedure is a fine-tuned measurement of something slightly different in the brain. And knowing what we want to study specifically or assess in the first place, we can decide which diagnostic tool is the best for our needs. Now, if you need a diagnostic aimed at tumor identification, you would obviously not need a heart diagnostic procedure aimed at studying vessel restriction or electrical activity. And the methods in which the researcher derives the data will obviously be different uh, and it will be derived via different diagnostic procedures. So furthermore, as demonstrated in this weekly material, the tests can even help to explain behavior, inhibition, and in this case, aggressive motivation. After reading the article by Hamzalo 2011 uh, regarding psychological testing as evidence in court, um, I started thinking about my own clients and how we utilize this goal-oriented treatment plan to alter behaviors in conjunction with pharmacological therapy. And I do agree with the comments of the author. If a person has demonstrated proven psychological patterns of aggression left untreated, it is undoubtedly going to reemerge after a completed cycle. And I am pleased that we are able now to distinguish mental illness and understand psychological treatment processes, I'm also inclined to believe that someone being freed in court based on the grounds of a mental affliction should therein also be treated for said affliction. And perhaps this study should be contingent on ongoing therapy until those scans demonstrate change.